And that requires a completely different style of leadership because we want to encourage people, we want to give them more autonomy, we want them to be more responsible, we want them to have greater creativity. So the old style of you do it this way because this way is best and if you don't, you're fired, simply mm. doesn't work anymore. Mm. It, it went out, actually, it went out with the dinosaurs. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I've worked with some dinosaurs, Steve. <laughs> Welcome to the Masks Off podcast, Leadership Strategies, No Disguises. I'm Razwana Wahid, and together with my co-host Olivier Laufvar, we talk to the smartest people in the world of leadership, change, and psychology to give leaders real strategies to bring human back to the workplace. If you would like to support our show, please subscribe to our channel, like us, or share this episode on your social media. It will help us greatly. In this episode, we speak to Steve Neal, psychologist and emotional intelligence consultant and trainer, about what motivates a team beyond money and achievement and the unique style of leadership that makes teams more creative. In your experience, when a business is going through a change and they have to let people go, typically, I think that's when leaders are concerned about how can we keep people motivated in the business while something is happening that is going to affect them very negatively. So in your experience, what do you think a leader can do to keep their team motivated during that time? In, in my leadership model, the first area that I look at as a foundation to you being able to thrive in life is basically having your core human needs met. And one of those needs that we all have is security, whether it be financial security or you know, stability of home, family, we need that. Obviously, if an organization is letting people go, that security need for many people feels threatened. And it's very difficult to thrive if we feel that our foundations are being pulled away and we are uncertain about the future. My advice, first first and foremost, is you've got to be honest and open about what's happening. If we try to brush it under the carpet and pretend it's not happening and just carry on life as normal, emotions don't go away. So if people have some level of anxiety, fear, concern about what's going to happen with their future and a leader's approach is let's just pretend it's not there. Let's you know, let's pretend the elephant isn't in the room. That's probably the worst approach because the fear is still there and it will manifest itself in a number of different ways. You know, there might be people starting to be more competitive because they're thinking, is it his job going to go or mine? There'll be backstabbing. There'll be people withholding information because they're afraid to say how they feel or they're afraid to look weak. So that's a bit of a disaster all round. So the first piece of advice is, whilst the leader might not have all the answers and might not have a magic wand and say, everything's going to be all right, I promise you, because nobody can guarantee that, to reassure people that they are aware that this might be worrying, concerning, it's not a great situation. And to at least to be open and honest about that. And also to share how they feel as a leader, because everybody likes a human being. If the leader is acting all strung and everything is great and everything's wonderful and I'm going to be a super optimist through these times, it's not realistic. So a leader who is prepared to say, you know, this is also uncomfortable for me. I don't know how you guys feel, but I'm concerned about this situation. I don't want to be in a position where we have to let people to go. I think that honesty and that human element is going to build rapport with people. It's going to build trust. And at least it's sending a message that we're in this together and this isn't comfortable for me either. And if the leader does at all care about people, then of course they are uncomfortable. You know, I've I've coached a number of CEOs and leaders who are in this position who are coming to me saying, Steve, help. What do I do? I, you know, I've got to let 10, 20, 30 people go over the next six months and it feels terrible. So, you know, m most of those leaders are suffering as well. They're going home having a sleepless night. They don't want to have that responsibility on their back. And they feel a sense of loyalty towards people, sometimes people who have been working with them for a long time. So I think if they can open up about that and be honest and say, I don't have all the answers. I don't have the magic wand. This is uncomfortable for me and you as well. So what I want to do is work with you together to make this the best train change position and transition that you could ever experience. I always remember my great friend and, and colleague Lisa, 
Lisa Spencer Arnell, she was recruited by one leader in one organization that had mass redundancies coming up. And her job was to make this the best redundancy ever for those people. <laughs> It and sounds a was... little bit, you know, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I like, I like, see already the language and it's yeah. also about language in organizations. I often talk about cortisol and stress creating language and dopamine and oxytocin, love and loyalty creating language. <clears throat> If you're focusing on this is bad, this is doom and gloom, and you know, this is and only on that, you are going to create cortisol, you are going to create mm. extra stress and anxiety. Actually, this was promoted as let's make this the best redundancy experience ever. Because that was genuinely what Lisa was trying to create. And in that process, staff were shown respect for who they were. They mm. were given lots of help and support about going back to their <clears throat> core um, values and what mattered most to them, which would help guide them in their future choices. And they were also given lots of practical advice on How do you do the best interview ever? How do you how do you play the executive search market? And all of those practical tools that they'll need, particularly for those that maybe haven't been searching for a job for a while. But more important than that, I think, was the reassurance that they're okay as humans, they're respected, and that this will be a difficult situation. I think a combination of that is going to make a bad experience by definition as good as it can be. I like, mm. I like what you said, actually, because what, when you said the best experience ever in terms of redundancy, I was suddenly in my <laughs> I head, I was picturing somebody with a pink shirt saying, yeah, let's go, guys, you know, but no, <laughs> it's not about that. You're all getting fired. <laughs> yeah, let's go, but You're let's not. make it very good, you know. No, it's, it's not about that, as you said. It's all about open, honest and respect, you know. But yeah. let me tell you one experience that I had in my company. We fired or let go or whatever term which is politically correct 45,000 people in two years right Ooh. okay the thing is nobody were talking about it you know they were you you were looking at my intranet and it was all about we are the best in the world and everything is super duper it's everything is super nice nobody were talking about it and when you say you know you need to be open honest and almost vulnerable for leaders to say, I don't know, I don't have the answer, it hurts me. There's a huge gap here. There's a huge gap, you know. Mm. And how do you convince leaders that this is, this is what they have to do? Because all the culture that you have, which is very common in control, you need to be the male, the alpha male, or the alpha female, or all this kind of stuff, you need to show that I'm not affected at all. How do you mm. tell these people that they need to do the opposite, basically? The answer to that is helping leaders to understand that there is a variety of different leadership styles. And to be a truly great leader, you need to be flexible. There was the, the trends two or three years ago or more with situational leadership, which I, I, you know, is kind of a buzzword. The way in which I agree with situational leadership is different situations do require a different style of leadership, albeit with authenticity. So this is not about leaders pretending to be someone they're not, but a leader should be flexible. You know, if a really important crisis comes in with an instant decision is made, perhaps a leader, just like someone who's leading an expedition in the Arctic, when an Arctic storm comes along, you need a leader to be directive and take charge and tell people what to do. Sure. But in many other situations, a leader needs to be more democratic, more understanding, more coaching in his or her style. Uh, building trust and rapport and empathy. And actually, you mentioned the word there, Olivier, um, vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Vulnerability breeds trust and loyalty and connection. Mm. Because Obviously. it's saying, I'm not this super strong leader with this wall around me, which is always, uh, you know, a, a facade. It, 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 it's, it's never true in all situations because no leader can be that. Mm. I'm actually human too. I don't have all the answers. I care about this and it worries and concerns me if some of my friends and colleagues are going to lose their jobs. But as a team, I want to work with you on this. I want to understand you and I want to support you in the best way that I can. That's not a directive leader. That's a, a democratic leader. That's a, a coaching style leader. That's a leader who builds affiliation. These are different leadership styles, which 
are really appropriate in these kinds of situations, I believe. I was actually speaking to uh, a friend of mine. She's a journalist and she was employed by the BBC for a while. And she was telling me that they, she also went through a period of, you know, redundancies and she wasn't one of the people losing her job, but she knew many that were. And I was talking to her about this very thing, that if you were in a business where the leadership in the business acknowledged what people were feeling and actually acknowledged, okay, mm -hmm. yes, on the one hand, we're doing this for the best of the, of, to the, of the business, but actually we still do care about you as people and your lives. And so we'll yeah. help you progress, you know, you know, train you for your next job, help you find a job, that kind of thing. And she said, if the leaders came to us and told us that, we probably would meet it with a lot of suspicion because how can you possibly on the one hand say that you're investing in the business only on the other hand you know, pretend to care about the people if let's say a leader came to you steve and asked that question how would you address that the suspicion of it again it's about authenticity if it's very easy to see the difference between her leader who's saying the right things because he or she is supposed to and a leader who is authentically being open and shows a little little bit of emotional vulnerability of course the leader has got to care if the leader doesn't care then perhaps they shouldn't be a leader in the first place, you know, if they're completely cold mm. to their people. Mm. But just assuming that the leader does authentically care a little bit about the people he or she's been working with for years, then that authenticity is going to be picked up by people's subconscious brains. You know, one of the things I talk about in my, my leadership model, we've got the limbic system, which has got six billion neurons of processing power every second compared to only 100, billion, 100 neurons of processing power in our rational brain. The subconscious brain is picking up all of the non-verbal cues, the slight changes in voice intonation, the non-verbal communication going through facial muscles, the body language, the tone, the variety of the voice, as well as the words that are actually said. Yeah. And the words that are actually said might sound perfect, but if they aren't meant from the heart, people feel it. People get a warning signal somewhere. So. The leader needs to speak from the heart. It takes a huge amount of effort and strain and energy to try to be someone that you're not. But if that leader sits down for an evening and that person reflects on how they're really feeling about this, why they're concerned about their staff and taps into those emotions and then shares them, it will be authentic. Yeah. Mm. And you won't have that problem of I don't trust you because people feel it rather than are told it. You said you said a scary word here, you know, in business, you know, a bad word, but nobody mentioned heart, heart, Whoa. you know. <laughs> and actually, I had a, a, you know, one of, of of a colleague of mine, a manager. She has been told, you know, you have too much of a heart, you know, you need to stop that, you know. <laughs> she has been, you know, she has been said by a manager, told by your manager stop with, with your heart thing. So have you seen this in, in organization or is it this changing now? I think there's a huge amount of variety out there, Olivier. And I think there are some organizations that get that no longer is it possible to treat humans as robots and machines. Yeah. Because the psychology and the neuroscience and the evidence of what really engages and motivates and, you know, excites people now is proving that that is not the case. Yeah. And we've and in, in psychology and neuroscience, we've known that for a long time. But for a long time, there's been a conflict or a disparity between what a lot of businesses try to do to get high performing, motivated, loyal staff and what psychology and neuroscience tells us actually creates high performing, motivated, loyal staff. So I think the wiser companies, and I've got a number that I work with to evidence this, they recognize this now. Right now, I've got a, a large contract with a, a, an international company based in Paris working internationally. They're giving people a, a leadership program for a year which is basically a professional and personal development program. So, you know, I'm teaching people to build up their self-belief and have more confidence in themselves, learn how to understand and manage their emotions, learn how to build empathy and rapport with other people, things that will be universally useful for them in their personal life as well as their professional life. Right. So it's a real gift to their employees. And the attitude is, why shouldn't our employees get this? And we fully realize that they'll use a lot of these tools at work, but also it will benefit in their friendships and their families and mm. you know, stuff that, you know, people come back to me after coaching saying that was fantastic. <clears throat> I, I did that with my kid last night cool. and he really responded well to how to express your emotions. So mm. 
And they openly recognize that and they have an attitude that our staff deserve that because our staff are human and we totally recognize we can't treat them like robots. And then there are other organizations that are still perhaps locked in the past where they've got this oversimplistic view of human beings. And whilst it can work in the short term, because sometimes those organizations are getting good business results, the leaders or managers with that style are meeting their KPIs, they're getting the, but, but from my experience, there's always a, pro a price and that price is lack of loyalty, lack of long-term employment. Mm. People would leave the company at the first opportunity. Mm. Their employees are working for a paycheck. Yeah. They're not they're not working because they get up in the morning thinking this is the best job in the world and I really love this company and we're making a difference. Yeah. And mm. I can't wait to get there. Mm. Yes. And someone that's got that a, a re transactional relationship which is I do the job and get the results but you pay me rather right. than a relational kind of bond which is actually I feel some kind of emotion towards working with you and this company. The first one is short term and quite fickle. The second mm. one creates what so many companies talk about but fail to achieve, which is long term motivation, engagement and loyalty. That's actually the thing right now. Engagement. Everyone now wants engagement. Actually, let me tell you something about that. You know, I went to the HR Expo in Paris. Every stand, they had a digital solution for it. Everything, <laughs> everything was digital, you know? Mm. So it's something, okay, fine, fine. You need systems, you need, you know, application and you need whatever, your 3D things, whatever, right? But something was lacking. Everybody wants engagement, motivated employee, loyalty, trust in all these things and their system. Is there like something which is, uh, but I'm not getting here or is there like something which are, we are not addressing properly? Yeah, I mean, again, I totally understand. I'm, I'm coming across more and more these super sophisticated digital engagement surveys. First of all, I've, I've met more than enough companies where on the engagement survey level, things look good. Oh, we're scoring a 72% for our staff. Our target is 75, but we're happy. Yeah. And then in one-to-one -one coaching relationships where staff really open up to me, I hear a very different story. Yeah. They work you like hell in this place. I'm stressed. My work-life balance. We're not respected. We're expected. It's the norm that we're supposed to be here till seven o'clock at night. And if we, we go earlier, people look down on us. That's what I hear from the staff. Whilst, but now, And I even know of a couple of organizations where the company is kind of pressuring staff to show high grades on these engagement survey, surveys so they can publish them and show to the world we're the best employer. Wow. So, so I even have examples of, you know, so, some of the top international companies where they get emails out from their line managers before the week before the engagement survey with a kind of <laughs> engagement survey is coming up. Now, I trust just like me, you find everything favorable. And, <laughs> you know, and and by the way, we are really keen to maintain our, you know, best employer or best <laughs> top five employer status in in this country. Just so you're aware of that. So you know uh, what uh, you need to do now. <laughs> you understand me? But, <laughs> so, so whilst there can be some validity in engagement service surveys, provided the, the right setup. So they should, first of all, be confidential so that people feel free and that people should trust in that confidentiality so people feel free to say what they really want to say. And secondly, that absolutely, there should be no leaning in any direction in which way people should answer. Um, with, with that, you know, with that not in place, I do question the validity. And the other problem with them is often they're competency based. So they might look at a superficial level of ba basically daily behaviors, but they often don't tap into underlying feelings, beliefs, attitudes right. that are the core to, to what really drives people. So the actual nature of the surveys as well, from my experience, can be quite superficial and only kind of touch the surface. I've worked in companies in the past where they've done the survey and then had little workshops to figure out where they can improve. And the stuff that came out in the survey is completely the opposite of what comes out in the workshops, because in the workshops, people then become more honest about how they're really feeling, which is uh, something that I think exists in many, many companies, like you said. Um, I think we should move on to the final question now. I guess in your experience, Steve, why do teams typically underperform and what can a leader do to increase performance? 
there are obviously a number of answers to that question and it very much depends on the team. But I'll, I'll talk about a common problem that I experience because the majority of my experience with teams is with senior management teams. The big problems are ego and individual need. So you've got the finance director and he's only really caring about his department and then you know and then you've got the marketing and sales director and she's only really bothered about her so what you've actually got is on paper it says we are the senior management team but what you've actually got is a group of people who've been put together it's just like a group of, of football fans they're all supporting the same team but they're not actually a team themselves they're a group because they haven't got clear roles mm. what is lacking is first of all clarity of the team's purpose yeah right. and that should obviously be linked to the organization's vision and purpose as well but what are you know okay we know what your job is in finance we know what your job is in marketing and sales what are we trying to set out as a achieve and achieve as a team that makes us a unit rather than eight individuals that happen to be put together and we have to sit in a room once a month which is really boring and a waste of time that's the first problem the second thing that teams lack is because first of all by, by solving the first problem you've got to create a sense of loyalty and purpose to the team and start challenging the egos because you know a very simple saying that i i believe in is it's about we go not ego but if you don't have a we go if you don't have a, a shared common purpose that everyone believes in which is bigger than any individual then you're going to ha end up with these egos and it's all about my finance, it's all about my sales, mm. etc. And then once you've got that common purpose, you need a clear code of behavior that the team agrees on and monitors and discusses and develops. And that normally stems from not a nice set of values on the wall that some consultant has created and the, the company's paid a lot of money for and you occasionally see it once in a while but means absolutely nothing <laughs> but by, by a living and breathing set of values that okay you know the organization can easily say it's about respect professionalism and integrity for us marvelous what the hell does that mean so has the team taken those values and actually broken that down into what does that mean for us? What does that mean in specific daily behaviors? And have we defined that behavior code? And how are we going to make a promise to each other that we all stay true to that? And how are we going to monitor and evaluate that? Are we going to have it as a regular item on our agenda? You know, so are we going to have in living and breathing values as a, as a code of way we behave? Or are they just something nice that we can show and put on a beautiful plaque and stick on our website. But actually it's meaningless because mm. no one's ever defined what respect means here. So, you know, Andre over here, he's going away behaving in one way and he thinks that's respectful. But, but Jonas here has got a totally different definition of respect and he does this and he thinks it's respectful. And of course they're constantly disagreeing on that. And again, it's about creating that agreed Right. living, breathing behavior code of values as a team and then monitoring and evaluating and measuring it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't mm -hmm. just agree on it. You've mm -hmm. actually got to act how, you know, and, and you use the values as an active part of your decision making, your meetings, your discussions so that they are meaning something rather than a waste of time. What I'm hearing here, it's not about competency in teams, you know, how to make like the best team ever. It's not about skills, competency. It's really about talking honestly with each other and see what he is you know it's about trust and opening as you said so I, I, I like that you know but i think it's the most difficult thing actually to achieve you know because you, as you said there's the ego always the ego in front you know i need to protect protect and protect i love that yeah. and again it comes back to who is in those leadership positions you know we talked earlier about leadership style and gone is the need for the solely directive, I'm strong, in control leader. That was great, possibly, when we were cavemen and women, but it's not so good in the 21st century. And, and also, you know, the business climate is changing. We've gone away now from the industrial time when it was all about hard labor. Right. And basically our main job was yeah. to get uh, Jonas to, to take the bricks from here to here in a faster time. The world now is a truly global concept. It's increasingly digital and we're relying on these international teams and it's all about intellect, creativity, 
p- production of new ideas. So we're, we're requiring more than ever use of different regions of our brains to stay one step ahead and be competitive on the market. It's a completely different. And that requires a completely different style of leadership because we want to encourage people. We want to give them more autonomy. We want them to be more responsible. We want them to have greater creativity. So the old style of you do it this way because this way is best. And if you don't, you're fired. Simply mm. doesn't work anymore. Mm. Mm. It, it went out. Actually, it went out with the dinosaurs. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I work with some dinosaurs, Steve. I reckon for some people. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode. Once again, if you would like to support our show, please subscribe to our channel, like us or share this episode on your social media. Merci 